From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. From the latest BCI Cattle Chat podcast, an extended look at pre-weaning strategies to minimize stress and maximize profits. To minimize the stress felt by calves, the experts at Kansas State University's Beef Cattle Institute cover several management strategies for producers to implement, including low-stress weaning, proper nutrition, as well as the timing of vaccinations. Also on today's program, former K-State Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee discusses new research showing that bat populations can put a significant dent in an insect problem for corn producers. It's all just ahead on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. This is Agriculture Today. The most recent BCI Cattle Chat podcast focuses on low-stress weaning, managing immunity prior to weaning, minimizing post-weaning weight loss, and pain management. In the first segment of Agriculture Today, K-State veterinarians Brad White, Bob Larson, and Brian Lubers, along with clinical assistant professor of the BCI, Philip Lancaster, and K-State professor of agricultural economics, Dustin Pendle, are joined by Dr. Shelby Roberts, a beef research scientist at Alltech. People say all the time, well, I should do low-stress weaning. I should do a low-stress weaning system. And I want to ask you guys, and and Brian, I'm going to ask you, what is low-stress weaning? What does that even mean? Well, I guess you'll probably get some different opinions on this one. But for me, you know, weaning, we think a lot about the nutritional change, but for me, weaning is is really a period to get them ready to the feed yard. And so low stress weaning is anything that helps prepare them for that move to that next production system. But I think it's making that transition from the farm to the feed yard an easier process for that animal. Yep. And making it as they're going to adjust from being on the cow. I know one of the things, Shelby, that we talk about is just simply the physical act of eating where these calves have been out grazing in pasture or with their mom and now we're asking them to eat something out of a a feed bunk. Any tips or tricks on getting them to get started on the feed or the water? I I think it's making those animals familiar with those feed bunks or waterers prior to removing them from the mother, right? So if we know if it's a stressful experience, have them the dams in there with the calves maybe prior and show those calves how they can eat from the bunk so it's less of a scary apparatus when those animals get into it. And and maybe it's something as easy as putting a feed stuff that they're used to seeing in there. So if you feed your cattle tubs on the pasture, put a stress tub maybe in the pasture so those calves are familiar with it and they're more likely to go eat from the, something like that. Yeah, it seems to me that the, the term low stress weaning has a lot of different definitions for different people. And for some, it means like fence line weaning, which I think certainly can be a form of low stress weaning. But some of the things that Brian talked about or Shelby talked about, basically anything to just make the time frame when we're moving away from their mother and a forage based <laughs> diet to being away from their mother and, and usually a combination of forage and concentrate. So that involves things that would get them riled up. So we're kind of moving away from using hot shots and dogs and things like that in the weaning process. Try to make it as as low stress as possible to both the cattle and the people. And I think it can look different for different operations. It doesn't always have to be a fence line weaning. I think that's a good method, but it doesn't have to be that. It's just low stress. Yeah, and I think Shelby brought up a great word. She said familiarity. So promote things with familiarity. Conversely, minimize novelty. Think of all the stressful situations that you've encountered during life, and a lot of that is associated with novelty. The first time you're doing something or the first time you're going through that process. So the more familiar we can be, I even think about, like you talked about feeding them in the bunks or doing some things. If you can feed them a little bit in the pen before they're actually weaned, they know where the feed is, they know where the water is. And Philip, any feed work fine? Or is there anything, any considerations I should take here as I'm starting to feed these calves? No, not not just any feed. We want specific feeds um, that they are familiar, again, familiar with and things that are, are palatable so that their consumption, because they're, they're get, used to just eating grass and, and you're trying to transition them to a, a kind of a mixed ration or a supplement with, with some free choice hay maybe. 
Some good examples are things like uh, distiller's grains that have a, a good smell, good palatable feel to them, texture to them. And then amazingly, Kevs really think that cottonseed holes are highly palatable. There's a mouthfeel to it or something that they really like. And so including you know, like 10% cottonseed holes, loose cottonseed holes in in that supplement or, or feed will encourage intake. So find the right feedstuffs, which again, and it sounds like we're adding some expenses to the process here. So Dustin, is is this, if I wean them, say I'm going to wean them, keep them at home for 30 days, is that going to pay off? Uh, it can. And there's been some research done, some colleagues here at K-State that uh, have found that if you wean calves 30 days prior to selling them, it does carry premiums and they can be anywhere from, you know, three, four, five dollars per hundred weight. And again, that's going to, of course, vary by year and whatnot. But there are premiums. Uh, research has has found the premiums anywhere from that three to five dollar per hundred weight. So that can be substantial as, as you think about a five weight calf that can be 25 bucks per head. So it could add up across the herd. But I have to make sure that and, and one of the reasons that there's a premium for that is, Brian, you mentioned it, it's preparing these calves for the next stage. And one of the things we think about is the process of weaning. Another component is how do we build immunity prior to weaning? Because we actually, ideally, we want to have immunity built before we reach any disease challenge. So if we're going to build immunity prior to weaning, what are some of the things you think about, Brian? Really, there's two ways a young calf can acquire immunity. And one is the colostral transfer of antibodies. So they get basically the immunity that their mother has. And even some, I'll say even some happens in utero, in the uterus too, during gestation. So though there's that part of it, which is the, the transferred immunity. And then there's the development of the calf's own immune system. And there's two ways that can happen. One is through natural infection, and then one is vaccination. So we think about vaccination as the I'll say the one that we can control a little bit, right? The most controllable one. The most controllable. So when we think about vaccinating and and they may have that colostral or immunity from the first milk, how young can I vaccinate these calves, Bob, and expect them to get a good immune response? Like all good questions, the the answer is it it depends. It depends on which of the germs we're talking about because some (coughs) of them can develop or stimulate an immune response earlier than others in the given situation. But by and large, what we know is that the calf will actually have a stronger, probably better immune response if he's a little bit older, closer to that time of weaning. And probably around two months of age is a time where it's pretty early in life, and yet it has a pretty good advantage. If we're really trying to prepare those calves for weaning, that two-month of age time is still okay. But then certainly coming out and boostering or giving their first vaccine closer to weaning time because those calves are a little bit older and their immune system is a little more mature, it can respond to that vaccination. So basically, your, your original question was how young is too young? I think most people would say around two months of age is, is a nice bottom age. And as we approach weaning, they should really start to respond. If they get to be you know five, six months of age, they typically respond pretty well to the vaccines that we give. But a couple of points that come out there. One, as you think about somebody talking about a pre-weaning vaccination and then a weaning vaccination, a lot of it depends on when your challenge is. Because you mentioned, I want to build immunity prior to that challenge. Well, if I'm going to wean them and keep them at home for a month, like we just talked about, maybe that first vaccination at weaning is just fine. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Oh, exactly. Because you're, they're not going to be commingled with other cattle from other herds, and they're not going to be trucked a very big distance or anything like that. So you could give a vaccination at the day of weaning and then boost to that a little bit later. Whereas if you were going to be moving them off farm and commingling them pretty shortly after weaning, well, then moving that vaccination a little bit earlier in life so that they've had some time to build immunity before they're actually confronted with a, with a challenge is a good idea. So it, again, that's why each ranch, each situation can be a little bit different. I think too, like it does depend. And so having, having your veterinarian and you make decisions about when to vaccinate, what to vaccinate for. I mean, I've seen some data that shows for some vaccines you can give even in after the first couple weeks of life. And so, but if you do that that early, you may have to manage that program differently later. So it's not a, a do it once and forget it. Whereas if you get out to weaning and vaccinate, maybe that is a one time. And so kind of walking through all those scenarios with your veterinarian is probably the best recommendation. Absolutely. And, and it depends a little bit on when your challenge is going to be, but also your level of response, which that level of just vaccinating the calf 
has very limited value unless that calf responds to it and builds a good immune response. And I know there are some nutritional components of that. Shelby and Philip, what what are some of the nutritional things I should be thinking about in making sure these calves are ready to respond? Well, I think just from a general nutrition standpoint, they just, you know, they need to be getting adequate protein, energy, and vitamins and minerals. And I'll let Shelby expand on, on this, but the mineral status is a pretty important one. Yeah, so I agree. So Alltech is a feed additive company. So we think about of how is minerals or things that we can add to the feed affecting growth. And minerals are a very important component of some of the immune responses we see in our calves. And so if our calves are just on grass and getting their nutrition from their mother, they're probably going to likely be deficient coming into a weaning period. So we really want to make sure that their mineral status is, is built up and adequate so that they can properly fight off those things. Cause I think y'all were talking about earlier, it's really important to build a resilient herd where we know that we can't eliminate all stress, but if we can prevent some of that, the impact of some of that stress, it's really important. And this also is going to reduce their health risk. And I know Dustin, you've got some data relative to how much difference it makes just to have these animals vaccinated. Right. And so we talked earlier about just weaning them carries a premium. Well, there's also premiums associated with certified health programs such as vaccinations. And research has found, you know, these certified health programs can range anywhere from one to five dollars per hundredweight. And and we've also seen across time that those premiums have been going up. Know how you're planning to market these calves as that may influence your expected economic payback on those. When Agriculture Today continues, part two of the latest BCI Cattle Chat podcast covering minimizing post-weaning weight loss and pain management. This is Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today continues with more from the most recent BCI Cattle Chat podcast. In this segment, K-State veterinarians Brad White, Bob Larson, and Brian Lubers, clinical assistant professor with the BCI, Philip Lancaster, K-State professor of agricultural economics, Dustin Pendle, and Dr. Shelby Roberts, a beef research scientist at Alltech, look at pain management and minimizing post-weaning weight loss. I also think we need to think about all of these premiums and everything you've quoted, the way that you've quoted is you say, oh, well, it's this much per hundred weight or this much per pound. The beef industry, it always comes back to pounds. And how many pounds are we going to be able to sell? And Philip, I'm going to tell you my experience, every time that I have weaned calves, it seems like the first week or two, they lose weight. Is that avoidable? How can I minimize weight loss in those post-weaning calves? Or is it something I should just expect and move on? Some weight loss is probably unavoidable, but we want to minimize the extent of that weight loss. And so the biggest thing is to get them drinking and then get them eating. Having that palatable diet, even if you can introduce that diet to them in a creep feed or something a little bit before weaning, so that when they make that transition... They are going to move right onto that feed from the the cow's milk and keep them going um, so that we can minimize that weight loss after weaning. Because I know from from an economic standpoint, that added weight is part of the advantage of that that weaning or preconditioning program. You get the premium and you multiply it by more pounds and you you get more weight, but that's easier said than done. And, And I think, Bob, as I think about those calves walking around the pen, it's not easy to get them to eat or drink because they're thinking about lots of other stuff. How, how do we make that work? I'm going to go back to a term we used before was low stress weaning so that as few novel things, and I liked what you said, novel things uh, are really what is causing stress. And so the fewer novel things that they're having to deal with. So if they've only been on a pasture with a pond, uh, they're used to drinking water off the ground, the pen, the type of water prior to weaning. So, and again, I think that's some of the, what people have talked about with the low stress weaning or the fence line weaning is actually the calves get to stay where they've been on a similar diet. And so you've just gradually changed a few things because I'm trying to avoid that situation where they're just bawling. They don't know what the feed looks like. They don't know how to drink out of a tank. And that's just too many novel things at once. So if I'm going to avoid that weight loss that you talked about, I think you have to have those calves really, yeah, yes, it's a new experience, 
but it's a new experience that they can handle because it's just not overwhelming with a lot of novel things. Shelby, what do you what do you think as far as transitioning to that diet? Any tips or tricks from your end on getting calves started on a feed that maybe they haven't been exposed to before? I think it starts with you got to start slow. You can't expect them to just go in there and be all hey to go at it for so maybe mixing in some feed that they we're familiar with before, whether that be topping it with hay uh, on top. So it, it kind of gets them interested and then they can start and eat that new diet from there. I think it's just a slow transition is important. Well, so I, I like what you said, and I'm going to tie that to what Bob said. This is one of the things that I like about fence line weaning when you can implement it, because you guys are saying, keep things as much the same as you can, keep them on relatively the same diet. Well, if you fence line wean, their main diet that they were eating before was grass and milk. So we take away the milk, they still have grass. The alternative is I put them in a dry lot and said, hey, this, I know you don't recognize this, but this is dried grass. I'm calling it hay now. And then I put feed in the bunk. And that's not limiting novelty. That's the nice thing about fence line weaning is I can kind of keep that transition a little bit smoother. And hopefully that makes things a little bit easier as we go to the next step and go forward. The other thing I wanted to comment on and just the process of weaning as part of this topic, what about facilities? And Brian, I know as, as we wean calves, often we're processing them. We're taking them through the facilities, maybe the same facilities that I've used for years. This is a good time late summer to start thinking about, are those the facilities I want to continue to use or any modifications? What are some of your thoughts relative to those facilities? Yeah. So I think, especially when we're taking animals off the of pasture and whether it's your first time with the facilities or really more importantly, the calf's first time with the facilities. So the bare minimum is just safety, right? So I think it's it's good to physically walk through those facilities, make any necessary repairs, you know, loose metal, things like that that are physically going to injure the calves. We got to get those fixed. And then you start thinking about, well, is if this is a facility that is normally used for larger animals. So, you know, bigger calves or adult cows, bulls, whatever, we need to adjust it to fit the calf, right? And so that may necessitate, you know, we have to work those calves as a separate group. So we've, we're able to adjust things. And really, I'm, I'm kind of a big fan of just having a dry run through the facilities. And we do that a lot in feed yards where if they bring in a new group of calves, they let them go through the tub or the snake or the the bud box in the alley or whatever they have, leave the front of the chute gate open and just let them go through once without touching them because we want them to have a positive experience going through. And I'm sure there's research, but I know at least anecdotally, people have found that, you know, the second time you, you bring them through when you're actually doing things with them, they just work better. And it, and we talked, we talked about low stress earlier. So it's all part of that low stress process. It's back to that familiarity and novelty. And, and we know as we work them through, sometimes we have to do additional procedures. And, and Shelby, I want to talk a little bit about your research that you did on managing pain and how to manage pain. And really, we're thinking about some of the procedures that we might do at or about weaning or castration and or dehorning or other potential procedures. I know some of your research was on castration. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before we get to what you found, I want to ask Bob, why doesn't everyone castrate already? Why are we castrating either at weaning or not castrating before they go through the sale? You know, that's a question that we've asked in the beef industry a lot. And a lot of it comes down to labor and facilities. In order to handle calves and do the surgical procedure of castration, you have to have, you know, fairly decent uh, chutes and alleys. And and you have to have some people that know what they're doing to make that happen. And and in a lot of our situations, uh, you know, we have lower labor availability. Facilities may not be optimized. And so it's it's easier just to let the next stop in the chain take care of that. So, I mean, I understand that. But I think that's something that we need to address to try to figure out ways to overcome some of those limitations. Absolutely. And Dustin, if we do overcome those, is there a price premium associated with this? Yeah, there's been some research out there that uh, shows, you know, not necessarily premiums, but discounts, you know, anywhere from four to eight dollars per hundred weight. And again, the heavier the calf, the larger the discount associated with that. So in this case, it's not a premium, it is you're going to get discounted if you've got bulls, but the net effect is the same, right? So it's going to it's going to decrease the value of those calves if I don't castrate them. 
So when I think about castrating, and, and let me give a specific scenario, if I have calves that are born in March and we roll around to November and I'm weaning those calves at that point and they're five or 600 pounds, Shelby, what, what have you learned from your research? Does pain management make a difference in those animals? Yes, it, it does make a difference in those animals because those older animals are going to be experiencing more pain than a younger, say, if we're castrating them younger. Um, but it's going to uh, depend mainly, uh, too, on the type of castration method you're using. So if you're knife cutting, giving something such as meloxicam, which is an analgesic, is something that is useful because that pain experience is at that moment and you're, you're being able to mitigate the total pain that animal's experiencing. Whereas if we're banding those animals, giving a pain relief at that point is not really useful because the pain that animal is experiencing is not at that time point. Two weeks later, when that band is, is restricting and it's starting to come off, that's when that animal is really going to be experiencing more pain. So it's really the timing of when we're going to give our pain management. We want to we want to time that specifically to the type of method we're using. Which, which all of us can relate to that because those are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or similar right. to like our ibuprofens. And if I'm going to do something in a couple of weeks, taking ibuprofen today is probably not going to help me. So Brian... Is there anything approved for relieving pain associated with castration in beef cattle? Right. And and I think it comes down to the question. We asked, why doesn't everyone castrate or dehorn? And we have the same question. Why doesn't everyone provide analgesia? And, and one, of, one of the hurdles to doing that is, you know, these are prescription products. And currently there aren't any of them that are labeled for pain associated with castration. And so we get into the realm of, okay, now we're using drugs extra labely, which we can do uh, under the guidance of a veterinarian. And then it, it boils down to some of these other issues about which product is going to be the most effective and the timing of that is association with the procedure that or the expected pain event that we're anticipating. All of those things come in, but we certainly can provide pain relief to these animals where we think it'll be efficacious but it just has to be done with the veterinary supervision. That's K-State veterinarian Brian Lubers. Brian, along with veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson, clinical assistant professor at the BCI Philip Lancaster, K-State professor of agricultural economics Dustin Pendle, and Dr. Shelby Roberts, a beef research scientist at Alltech, covered a variety of issues regarding weaning, vaccinations, and pain management. The BCI Cattle Chat podcast is produced by the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. To listen to the full podcast, visit ksubci.org. This is Agriculture Today. Listening to Agriculture Today over the K State Radio Network. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. In today's agricultural news, the latest Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report from USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service shows there were 6.6 days suitable for field work last week. Topsoil moisture supplies rated 11% very short, 33% short, 54% adequate, and 2% surplus. Subsoil moisture supplies rated 9% very short, 31% short, 58% adequate, and 2% surplus. Corn condition rated 2% very poor, 8% poor, 25% fair, 54% good, and 11% excellent. Corn silking was 88%, equal to both last year and the five-year average. Dough was 46%, behind 51% last year, but near the 42% average. Dented was 4% behind 10% last year and near the 8% average. Soybean condition rated 4% very poor, 6% poor, 31% fair, 53% good, and 6% excellent. Soybeans blooming was 71%, behind 77% last year, but near the 72% average. Setting pods was 39%, behind 33% last year, but near the 38% average. Sorghum condition rated 2% very poor, 5% poor, 27% fair, 60% good, and 6% excellent. 
Sorghum headed was 43 percent, near 41 percent last year, and ahead of the 38 percent average. Coloring was 3 percent, equal to both last year and average. Cotton condition rated 0% very poor, 5% poor, 34% fair, 56% good, and 5% excellent. Cotton squaring was 84%, near 85% last year, but ahead of the 76% average. Setting bowls was 43%, ahead of 27% last year, and well ahead of the 23% average. And pasture and range conditions rated 3% very poor, 13% poor, 32% fair, 48% good, and 4% excellent. Well, this week is National Farmers Market Week, and it highlights not only the markets themselves, but the innovations that allow these institutions to continue customer service in their communities. Rod Bain reports. The first week of August is National Farmers Market Week, per proclamation by Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. And Christina Cannell of the Agricultural Marketing Service says as of 2019, We estimate that there are over 8,000 farmers markets in the 48 states across the country. With several of those remaining open during the pandemic through innovations. Innovations they are continuing despite in-person operation for this season. Because they've been able to find new customers through their adaptations. Such as at a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania farmer's market. Creating a one-way market. So one entrance and one exit. And they were able to monitor kind of traffic flow and people in this densely populated neighborhood. While the Rochester, Minnesota farmer's market institutes a drive through model where people ordered online and they could do kind of curbside pickup and drive through at an enclosed pickup facility. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. In other agricultural news, Frank Mitloner, a professor at the University of California, Davis, who has spent nearly two decades studying the relationship between the livestock industry and air quality, will be the featured speaker for the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture October 11th at Kansas State University. His talk, Rethinking Methane, Animal Agriculture's Path to Climate Neutrality, is scheduled for 7 that night in McCain Auditorium. Admission is free. Kansas State University established the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture Series in 2015 to provide science-based education about world food issues. And finally, in this week's Milk Lines, K-State dairy specialist Mike Brook looks at the timing of corn silage harvest, which he says is key to maximizing yield and energy for dairy cattle. Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning corn silage harvest. You know, one of the questions I get at this time of year is when should we take our corn silage and when should it be harvested? And there's lots of different rules of thumb we use and just want to discuss a few of those uh, today. So one of the general rules of thumb you need to be thinking about is generally somewhere about 42 to 47 days after silking would be an appropriate time for us to harvest corn silage. Now, that's not the only number you use, but that's a pretty fair number to use just to get a handle on when you might actually need to devote a lot of labor toward corn silage harvest. Now, the big issue that we always have to deal with is how do we maximize the amount of yield that we get along with the amount of energy for our animals? Well, there are actually three main things that control the yield. Number one is the genetics that we utilized. Number two would be the planting date, but the one that overshadows those two is actually the timing of harvest. So two of those things have already been decided, the genetics that you planted as well as the date that you planted. Later you plant, generally that reduces yield. So planting earlier, longer season varieties generally will yield more tons of corn silage. Now let's talk about the timing factor for just a second. You know, as we look at corn silage, about 50% of the dry matter should be actually grain. And that grain will represent about 65% of the energy that your dairy animals will eventually derive from the corn silage. So maximizing the amount of starch is a really, really important part in trying to figure out when to pull timing. We also talk about whole plant dry matter, and yes, that is important. Ideally, we want to hit between 35 and 38% dry matter, and that's on the whole plant. So as we push toward the 38%, what we're trying to do is give the corn just a few more days to develop a little more starch. So if you're doing the milk line, when the starch is about three-fourths of the way through the kernel depth, That's about the time we really need to start thinking about, well, how dry is that corn? Now, a couple of things to remember. 
Each additional day that we wait, we generally add about one point of starch to the total. So it's really important. Just a few days here will make a pretty big difference in total starch content at this stage of the game. The other thing you're working against is that dry matter is starting to go away from the plant as we get closer and closer to full maturity. So generally we, we lose about a half to maybe six-tenths of a point of moisture every day. Again, it depends on whether or not the plant is alive or dead. Yes, if we have drought-stricken plants or we have plants that have been affected by leaf disease, the plant is actually dying, and therefore it will lose dry matter much quicker. So you have to take those things into consideration as you make these decisions. Above all, regardless of when you pull the trigger, you need to make sure you properly use your kernel processor on your choppers so you effectively get as much starch available to the cows as possible. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to consider carefully when they pull the trigger to start silage harvest. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. You're listening to Agriculture Today. you now on agriculture today it's our weekly wildlife management segment once more and joining us is former k-state research and extension wildlife specialist charlie lee charlie we've had occasion in the past to talk about bats and their benefits as a wildlife species want to spend more time on that today and bats of course are rather common in kansas yes we have numerous species of bats in kansas Some of the more common species would be little brown bats and big brown bats, which are found in all parts of the United States except in a few southern parts of Florida and Texas. And I think there's good reasons for all of us to understand and welcome and encourage bats because of their benefits. We've talked several times about the benefits of pest control, the improvement in pollination of some plants. They're also important in seed dispersal. I think it's uh, important to also realize that this is a species that's adapted well to urban and suburban environments. So they're providing some pest control services in places where pesticides are probably not as, as welcome or as utilized. And we understand now a little bit better about their role in control of mosquitoes. We do know that bats eat mosquitoes, but some of the early research, which was done in the 1950s, said that bats could catch about 10 mosquitoes per minute. Additional studies have shown that that's not the number of of mosquitoes that are eaten when there are other insects available because most of the time their major foods are beetles and true bugs rather than mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are part of their diet, but certainly they're not really known for their mosquito control. But they're rather unheralded as far as controlling other insects and some of economic significance in agriculture. Yeah, they're important uh, in controlling cucumber beetles, uh, may beetles or June bugs, stink bugs. Cucumber beetles are certainly one that's very important. It's one of the most significant ag insect pests in the United States. Uh, Those beetles attack corn and spinach and many other types of plants, but the greatest impact is by the larvae, corn rootworms. We've got rootworms that reduce corn productivity up to 13% with insecticide cost uh, running up to $25 or more per acre, and that damage costs the farmers in the United States about a billion dollars annually. There's been some research done recently in Illinois that looked at some of the impacts of bats on pest crops. Uh, It was a two-year project. They found that when corn was planted at a normal schedule, they found 59% more corn earworm larvae where the bats were excluded. Hmm. They also showed that they provide enough predation pressure on adult corn earworms to affect the larval numbers. When you looked at that as the effect of bats on crop damage, that suppression of corn earworm larvae was significant to reduce the crop damage. There were more than 50% more damaged kernels per ear in places where bats were excluded. Well, that's a difference maker then, obviously. Well, we know that that's not the only problem. Uh, They also, corn earworm larvae, 
feed on the corn foliage when there are no ears present. So that's going to be reducing productivity. And then one that was, many had not previously thought about is that bats have an impact on pest-associated fungi. More ears had fungal growth where bats were excluded than not. So in addition to those higher levels of fungi infection, they found significantly higher concentration of humonison in the exclosures. Good reasons then to encourage bat activity around cropping areas and perhaps elsewhere and figuring out ways of attracting bats in. Well, there are several things that are important to, to do to try to uh, encourage bats to stay in an area. One of those is to improve the habitat. Uh, we're losing roosting areas for bats and we're losing foraging areas, which are often around small wetlands or riparian areas. That's one of the biggest threats is loss of habitat. So we can reduce some of those. On a smaller scale, we can stop removing and dropping dead trees. Many bats will roost between the bark on some dead trees and the trunk of the tree or even in the crevices and cracks in the tree trunk. Sometimes we'll also roost in hollow limbs. Leaving those is going to improve that roosting habitat. We can also reduce and eliminate some pesticide use, uh, particularly in some of the things that are not as effective or not particularly targeted. And then the last one that I encourage people to consider is keeping cats indoors. Um, when bats are able to be captured uh, outdoors, cats are pretty efficient predators. And one can go one further in as far as putting up a bat house if they're so inclined. Yes, bat houses in some locations have had uh, good success. They're a little bit more difficult to attract bats to bat houses in Kansas than they are in some other states. I don't think we understand really the reasons why bats are so slow to occupy houses in Kansas. But what we have learned is that you need to use weathered lumber, something that's been exposed outdoors for a few years before you're going to get bats to utilize it. Make sure that the bat houses are tall, the bat houses are not to be installed in trees, and make sure they're put in an area where they receive good sunlight so that the bats can stay warm. Those are some of the tips that I think people can use to improve uh, the success of installing bat houses. There are lots of plans available online where people can purchase or build bat houses. Lastly, one of the main things is that folks need to get past the stigma of having bats around. They are not the threat that many people perceive them to be. Well, that's one of those issues that it's very difficult to get people to accept that bats uh, should be looked at as a beneficial animal rather than a pest. It just takes education and understanding of, of all of the benefits that they can provide to help people get over that Fear. And in that vein, there's a quick look at bats as beneficial consumers of harmful insects out there. Charlie, thanks for the word. Former wildlife specialist Charlie Lee, K-State Research and Extension with us. He's a regular guest every Tuesday right here. And with that, today's edition comes to a close. Remember, check out our podcast service website. That's at agtoday.net agtoday.net and please rejoin us right here tomorrow as well. For Jeff Wickman, Eric Atkinson here, bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.